So, this is going to be a more topical video today because we are going to be going over an interview that Koei Horikoshi had with Viz and or Shueisha about 10 years of My Hero Academia. So, get ready because there are some interesting things about it. Hey guys, how's it going? It is your boy, Manga Man Drew, and I'm here to go over a recent development in the My Hero Academia fandom when it comes to My Hero Academia's most likely 10th anniversary and how we do have a blog post on Viz that pretty much is an interview view of Koei Horikoshi just coming to a realization that My Hero Academia is going on its 10th year anniversary and it's something that is very unique to this interview how it begins to address some of the audiences of the western fandom so this is something big and what i'm going to be doing in this video is reading through pretty much the entire interview in its entirety and if you want to read the interview on the viz uh blog you can do that by just going to viz.com slash blog and it should be the first blog to pop up and if not if you're watching this video a little bit later than when it was released because this was released july 22nd 2024 what you need to type into the search bar is viz.com slash blog slash post slash kohei horikoshi on 10 years of my hero academia all right without the way let's go right into the interview with the first interview question so the interviewer starts off by saying that the recent character popularity poll results have generated attention overseas. Were the results as you expected? Were there any surprising characters? And Kohei Horikoshi responds with, I was pleasantly surprised by Shoji's rise in the rankings. It made me really happy. Other than that, there weren't many surprises. I see the popularity polls as a celebration for the readers who vote. So as an author, I try not to get too emotionally involved and try to keep my distance if possible. It's more like, oh, this character is indeed popular. But I was genuinely happy about Shoji. I told my editor, Imamura-san, that Shoji has limited appearance in the story and his unique look doesn't typically qualify as, quote, handsome. So I'm pleased I drew him thinking he's really cool. So I'm glad people appreciated him. And this is very cool. Uh, I am a big fan of Shoji. He's not like my top 10 favorite characters, unfortunately, but he is up there as one of my underrated favorite characters. And the fact that Kore Hoikoshi doesn't really take like that much interest in it, but took interest in the fact that Shoji is as popular as he was is something that I'm very happy about because I, like Kore Horikoshi, was very excited to see Shoji in like the top 10 of the popular characters when it comes to pretty much this being the final popularity poll most likely for my hero academia so i'm happy about that and going into the next question we have the interview saying that the names of heroes are very cool and interesting how did you come up with them what was your inspiration and horikoshi responded with i don't recall putting that much thought into it i think i chose names based on how they sounded i wanted the names to be catchy and memorable and intuitively connect with the character's appearance however we haven't had many new characters recently the last one might have been star and stripe honestly i don't remember much about about them and the second interview question really ties into that by saying have american comics influenced you horikoshi responds with yes though it's really just a surface level inspiration i constantly try to give the heroes names that feel like they belong in american comic books so this is very interesting because when it comes to the hero names uh we see that they don't really have that much input on like why they were chosen which is very interesting because a lot of the hero names do match the characters themselves which even Kore or Koshi himself said that that was the plan but that he didn't really add that much depth to it but then there are some character names like king explosion murder god dynamite that does have a little bit more like sway to that idea that there may have been like a little bit more input into it but that could just me be reaching for a little bit more in this naming of the characters especially their hero names but that could just be nothing like horikoshi said so that's interesting and what's even more interesting is the idea that a lot of like the uh tropes that he's pulling from most likely than not or the ideals of like heroes when it comes to uh comic books is very much more surface level which may deal with the idea that this is a story about superheroes 
in a Japanese world, in a manga. So it's taking like the aesthetic of the comic books of American comic books and not really taking a lot of the story tropes, which makes sense since My Hero Academia is very much a traditional uh, Japanese manga story and does not tell the story in a very much American comic way. So I like that that is something that we get a little bit more clarification on when it comes to the story of Vihar Academia and its inspirations. And the next interview question is something very interesting and very pertinent to the story even at this moment because this interview most likely took place prior to the recent chapter. And that interview question is, what does it mean to be a hero to you? And horror culture response is, that's a tough question. If I could articulate it clearly, I probably wouldn't be drawing manga. So I'd say, please read the manga. Initially, heroes were those on a different level from me, like Oda Sensei from One Piece, or fictional characters like Goku from Dragon Ball. But as I entered my 30s, I began to appreciate those people nearby who offer support, which ties into the current story of My Hero Academia. My appreciation has been growing towards the people who extended a helping hand or offer encouragement. For example, Ima Murasan, my editor, has been a huge supporter. I've grown to see these everyday helpers like him as heroes too. So now I think anyone can be a hero, including those who support me closely. And yeah, this is something that is very interesting because this idea of what it means to be a hero as stated by Koei Horikoshi is very much reflected in the story of My Hero Academia as a whole, especially in one of the more recent chapters where we have a whole bunch of people or in a whole bunch of students just chiming in to help with the reconstruction of society in smaller ways and supporting the heroes and in a way that is kind of what we saw during the war with the support course with the business course with the civilians all pitching in in small ways but those small ways are them acting as heroes so i kind of like how there is like a reflection of horikoshi in the story about how he views the heroes and that this entire story is his explanation of what he believes it means to be a hero which pretty much boils down to heroes are people who are willing to give support to others. But for there, we do have the next few interview questions, which really are interesting when it comes to how Horikoshi has been writing the story, especially when it comes to the characters that are in the story, as well as their backstories and their background. With the first question being, are there any characters or stories you wanted to explore more, but didn't get the chance to? And Koei Horikoshi explains, it's not quite about not getting the chance, but I have characters and backstories that I created, but don't intend to include in the story. For instance, I have detailed stories from the previous inheritors of One For All. I intentionally left these out. I know it's a little off from what the question was asking. As the second question is, do you want to draw those backstories at some point? And Horikoshi says, no, not at all. Rather than drawing out all of the well thought out backgrounds and episodes, I wanted to hint at those elements instead. For instance, in Terminator 2, John Connor became a leader in the future and Schwarzenegger's character is sent from the future world. But there aren't many depictions of the future itself because the future isn't depicted in detail. The viewers' imaginations expand and I thought that that was really great. So I wanted to create something like Terminator 2. I might have strayed a bit from the original question though. And the final question that he puts out is, so while there are characters you thought up but didn't draw, there's nothing you feel you missed. As Kohei Orikoshi responds with, exactly. And this part may kind of ruffle some people's feathers because a lot of times people think that Kohei Orikoshi is rushing through the story and that there are things that he's glossing over just to get to the end. Well, this is saying that this is all intentional, that this is all that he had planned most likely from the start to the end, as well as when it comes to characters and their backgrounds, that he actually intentionally leaves stuff out because that's just the type of writing style he thinks is best. And we can kind of see that with Lady Nagin about how he explained that, oh, he could have put a lot more of Lady Nagin's story that could cover an entire volume, but that he chose not. And that's kind of reflected in how Horikoshi tells backstories. For instance, 
when it comes to Aizawa and Present Mike, they had an entire backstory in a spinoff manga, but that Horikoshi decided not to put that in the proper story, not because that he couldn't, but that he didn't feel that it would fit. And this kind of tracks with how Horikoshi writes his backstories as well as flashbacks, which are primarily contained within just a couple of chapters. So if you're mad at the fact that we don't get a lot about the previous uses of One For All, that is just Horikoshi's intentional author's choice. And whether you like it or not, that is his intention, to make it seem a little bit more grander and allow for us as the fans to think about what it could be instead of it just being put in hard detail. And we're approaching pretty much the end of the interviewing questions. And the last part of the interview is pretty much addressing the fandom overseas, as well as what My Hero Academia has done within the recent year. So the interviewer first off starts by congratulations on My Hero Academia reaching 100 million copies in circulation worldwide. The English versions consistently appear on North American bestseller lists. What do you think about the global success? And his response, Koei Horikoshi says, honestly, it doesn't feel real to me. And the interviewer asks, why is that? As Koei Horikoshi responds with, I feel it's largely due to the efforts of those selling and promoting the manga overseas. I don't feel like I accomplished this alone. It feels like I've been lifted up by those who set up the distribution channels and decided to air the anime abroad. I feel like the 100 million copies was a collaborative effort rather than something I achieved myself. The interview response was, that's quite humble of you. As Koei Horikoshi responds, it's not humility, it's more like, is this really okay? And I will say that this response really tracks with what we've seen of Koei Horikoshi in the past when it comes to his interviews with Oda or just statements that he's made in the manga itself. That he pretty much is putting everyone above him for the success of My Hero Academia instead of just himself. And that this really just shows how much in the international audience has played a role in My Hero Academia's success. And this is something that is very much recognized by Koei Horikoshi himself, even though he's unwilling to really take the credit because this is his story and these are the characters that he made. And those are the primary reasons why people have come and flocked to his series and want to be a part of reading it as it ends. So this tracks with who Horikoshi is as a person and is very much similar to how Deku is as a character in the story, which you can kind of draw a lot of parallels between the two characters because most likely they're not, Koei Horikoshi has put a lot of himself inside of Deku and potentially Mandata when it comes to the story of My Hero Academia. And now we're approaching the final part of the interview where we have the interview talking about the international readers evaluate the manga quite strictly. Many people stop reading it halfway through if they find it boring. So My Hero Academia continued sales success means that many people find it entertaining. And Koei Horikoshi responds with, well, if you point it that way, no, thank you, really. It must mean that people are acknowledging it as a quality series. As the interview responds with, I feel North American readers in particular are hard to please, so it's impressive that very new volumes of My Hero Academia rank highly upon release. As Koei Horikoshi responds with, if that's the case, then I'm glad. It means I've managed to create something genuinely interesting that makes me happy, honestly. And then the final question is, finally, could you give a message to your overseas readers? As Koei Horikoshi responds with, we're in the final stretch of the manga serialization. There aren't many chapters left, but I do ensure that the readers feel it is worth sticking with to the end. Your thorough but warm support keeps me going, so please continue reading. And you know what? That last part is just very, very, very heartwarming. That Horikoshi is pretty much beginning to accept his success, that the reasoning why he is successful is because he's made an interesting story. And people love the story for what it is because it came from him. And towards the end, he gives like a message to all of us North American readers, most likely acknowledging that we very much scrutinize his work, but the fact that it's still ranking high in like the polls or when it comes to bestsellers in My Hero Academia just really shows how great of a writer he actually is when it comes to writing an interesting story about superheroes and how we're just eating it up because it's actually quality and that he's very grateful that we were able to provide him this support so we should continue to support him until the series ends and beyond plus ultra but yeah that's pretty much all I really have for the interview. I thought this was a very interesting interview, getting a little bit more understanding of 
how Horikoshi works, as well as getting a better understanding of like how he's able to view the American audience most likely, or the North American audience, and just getting a little bit more thoughts that he may have on us as readers, which is not necessarily something that you really see from mangaka from Japan. They don't really express like outward like interest in the foreign market, but they do recognize it, and it's glad to see that Horikoshi is one of those that recognizes the Japanese audience, as well as the American audience for the support of their series. But yeah, let me ask you this. How do you feel about the interview? Did you like it? Did you dislike it? And what was your favorite question? Leave your thoughts down below and don't forget to subscribe to my YouTube channel for more content like this. Do all that cool jazz. Hopefully I'll be able to catch you in my next video. Goodbye.